Great. Uh, welcome, everybody, to um, the World Humanitarian uh, Forum digital event. Um, very, very pleased to have uh, everybody with us today. Um, just want to introduce the session, uh, kicking off uh, our Partnerships for the Goals uh, discussion. I'm very, very happy to have um, esteemed colleagues on the panel uh, today speaking. Um, just to say, uh, it's well understood now that supporting the SDGs requires wide-scale collaboration from a variety of sectors, uh, from public and private, uh, local organizations, businesses, foundations, INGOs, individuals, and international institutions. And ever more, leveraging the knowledge of the private sector in supporting the SDGs has become vital for future success. Um, whether it be an expertise in te telecommunications, water, sanitation, public health, food security, or financing, the private sector can bring unique capabilities, expertise, resources, and experience, catalyzing positive changes across the sector. The session today will look at the biggest opportunities and challenges to, pub uh, to public and private partnerships, whilst considering the role of trust, shared values, and inclusive growth, the importance of everyone contributing to a sustainable world. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined, um, like I say, by a number of esteemed colleagues <clears throat> with wide ranging and extensive experience in building meaningful and impactful partnerships that deliver tangible results. First, let me introduce Rebecca Marmot, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer for Unilever. Uh, Rebecca is responsible for driving the company's overall sustainability strategy and transform transformational change on priority areas of Unilever's sustainable living plan. As CSO, Rebecca also leads the next chapter of Unilever's sustainability journey beyond Unilever's sustainability plan. Prior to this role, Rebecca was Global Vice President of Sustainability at Unilever, where she led the global advocacy, policy, and partnerships team, heading engagement with external stakeholders and building the optimal enabling environment to drive sustainable business. Under her leadership, Unilever played a key role in major sustainability milestones, such as the 2015 Paris Agreement, and the creation of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, positioning Unilever at the forefront of sustainable business. Before joining Unilever, Rebecca served as a Global External Affairs Director at L'Oreal and in External Affairs at the UK Department of Trade and Industry. Here, she was responsible for stakeholder management on UK government projects. Rebecca is also a non-executive director for water and sanitation for the urban poor. Also joining us today is Tara Nathan, Group Executive and Executive Vice President, leading humanitarian development sectors for MasterCard. Tara has worked as a diplomat in the US Foreign Service, serving in posts in Taiwan, Japan, and China. She has also headed Citigroup's cross-sell business and also held various management roles across Citigroup's retail banking business, including commercial banking, risk and operations, and is also the former Chief Executive of Mobile Payment Solutions, a MasterCard and Smart Hub joint venture leading the innovation and commercial development of the MasterCard Mobile Payments Gateway. Currently, Group Executive and Executive Vice President for Public-Private Partnerships at MasterCard, Tara leads the company's strategy to build partnerships with governments and international development organizations focused on innovative new technical and commercial solutions to tackle pressing development issues such as humanitarian response, financial identity, and government efficiency and transparency. We're also pleased to uh, welcome Anna-Marie Hu, Acting Executive Director of the United Nations Office for Partnerships, uh, appointed acted, Acting Executive Director for the UN Office for Partnerships in April. Uh, Anne-Marie uh, is concurrently Senior Communications Advisor in the Executive Office for the Secretary General and has served as Chief of Staff and Director of the Executive Office for UN AIDS, also previously overseeing the Global Advocacy and Communications Portfolio. Prior to join UN, joining UNAIDS, Anne-Marie worked in the philanthropic field with a focus on health and children's issues. She was the communications director at Casey Family Programs, an operation, operating foundation dedicated to child welfare issues started by the founder of UPS. And Anne-Marie also served as the first global health communications manager at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and as the family's spokesperson. An award-winning writer, she started her career as a television journalist. Uh, Anna, Anne Marie is also a member of the Alumni Advisory Board for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce Shirin Parkville 
Frick Borg, Chief of Section for Private Partnerships and Philanthropy for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. Sharon has worked with the United Nations for the last 15 years in various capacities, mainly serving in field operations in Afghanistan, Sudan, the Gaza Strip, Libya, and most recently as the head of the Resident Coordinator's Office in Jerusalem. Sharon is an experienced leader and has supported the UN as a political advisor in senior roles across the globe, also with experience working in the private sector and as a researcher in academia. Uh, finally, let me introduce Gideon Maltz, Executive Director of uh, the Tent Partnership for Refugees. Gideon previously served as Deputy Chief of Staff to Ambassador Samantha Power at the US Mission to the United Nations, Director of Human Rights and Multilateral Affairs at the US National Security Council, and Senior Advisor to the Administrator of the US Agency for International Development. Prior to his government service, Gideon worked as an attorney in the international trade practice of Hogan Lovells and as a consultant at McKinsey and Company. He also served as a junior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and Pre-Doctoral Fellowship at Stanford Center for Democracy and Development and Rule of Law. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, I'll be moderating today. My name is Jonathan Brooker. Um, I'm recently uh, a, a new board member of the advisory board of the World Humanitarian Forum. I am director of Solidarity International in the UK and head up our global partnerships team uh, at Solidarity. I'm responsible for overseeing all of our private partnerships and, and lead SI in the UK. I've spent most of the last 18 years responding to various different humanitarian crises and disasters, working with the UN, uh, Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, United Nations Development Programme, uh, INGOs, and with media, mostly based in the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, and now in Europe. Uh, I also sit as the chair of the START Fund Committee, supporting uh, the START Network, um, and have a bachelor's degree in theology uh, and a master's from the uh, London University School of Oriental and African Studies. I thank you all very much for being with us today. Um, and I'd like to start the session by inviting the speakers to take three minutes each for opening statements before we get into some questions and answers and some vibrant discussions. Anne-Marie, perhaps I can ask you if you could start for us. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and it's really great to be here. Maybe I'll say a quick word about what the UN Office for Partnership does. We really think of us as your gateway to the UN. The UN is a vast, it can be very big, like a maze, and we really want to be there to help you connect, um, as well as co-create. We need really good solutions for us to reach the sustainable development goals. And one of the messages this week I've been really thinking about is that idea of the global public good and making sure that everyone everywhere has access. And the other part of it that we don't always talk about is that everyone gets that access at the same time and that there isn't this massive lag between people who are getting um, access to services and programs and products and people who are not able to get them and are waiting and waiting. If anything, COVID-19 has really shown us those pre-existing inequalities can be deepened if we aren't really are careful right now. And we have that opportunity to make sure that things moving forward, that we have this plan, that we have that ability to be able to reach everyone everywhere at the same time. Thanks. Thank you ever so much, Anne-Marie. Um, Rebecca, perhaps you would like to come in for us. Hi, so can you hear me okay? Very well. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for, for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, I think when I looked at the title and it was about partnerships for the goals, um, I was really excited to see so many uh, friends that are of Unilever and, and organisations that we partner with, which I think for me probably sums up my introduction. Unilever um, is one of the world's largest companies. We have 400 plus brands, over a third of the planet use our, our products every single day and we're in virtually every single country in the world. But I think when I look at what we try to achieve in terms of sustainability, um, we wouldn't be able to achieve any of what we do, or certainly not to the level that we achieve it without working with partners. Um, and I think when you look right the way across Unilever's ecosystem from the farmers in the field uh, through to the manufacturing, 
the brands and the way that we bring our products to life, really getting behind those key social and environmental goals, and then the role that we can play by orienting and modeling our business through a multi-stakeholder model, uh, and the role that we can play in terms of transformative change, all of that is absolutely um, accelerated through the partnerships that we have with, with many of the organizations that are here on this call today. So excited to be part of this conversation, looking forward to talking about the multi-stakeholder business model that we've created, not about short-term financial gain, but really thinking about putting sustainability front and center and prioritizing people and the planet as we grow the business in a sustainable way. So looking forward to the chat. That's great. Thank you ever so much. Um, Tara, perhaps you would like to come in for us. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone around the world. Thanks for inviting MasterCard to participate. I think I'll just follow suit of my colleagues here and give a brief introduction into <clears throat> maybe MasterCard and our role in this space. Uh, MasterCard, we've been involved in uh, this world of doing well by doing good, uh, I'd say for well over 10 years. Um, the thing at MasterCard for us is that the notion of how we can have uh, positive impact on society. Um, you know, the SDGs, I think, is, is one codification of that. But our mission and mandate to have impact, positive social impact, I would say is um, it's embedded in every aspect of MasterCard. It's not in one group. It's not just in sustainability or in, or in our government uh, affairs team. It really permeates the entire organization. Uh, I have the privilege of running a social impact business at MasterCard. Uh, and what is that? We sort of straddle, if you will, philanthropy and on the one hand and the pure commercial business on the other. Uh, we are in the business of building um, commercial infrastructure. So what we try to do is leverage MasterCard's core capabilities. What do we do every single day? We extend digital infrastructure to give people around the globe in over 210 countries and territories the ability to transact safely and securely. Uh, my business takes that and says, how do we adapt and accommodate those skill sets, those business models, those go-to-market mechanisms in a way that enables us to serve the poorest, the most marginalized, the most rem remote communities? Because we recognize that their needs are, are unique. Um, so that's what my business does. We uh, not only MasterCard, our core business, but and my business is no exception, we do not operate in a vacuum. We operate um, in partnership with uh, an ecosystem of stakeholders, uh, private sector, public sector. We have, uh, and what our business and what MasterCard does is we coordinate and bring all these entities together. So partnership for us uh, is not just the subject of uh, a uh, World Humanitarian Forum panel or uh, a UN panel. Frankly, partnership is really the crux of what we do as a business, uh, bringing together stakeholders in order to accomplish, um, as was previously men mentioned, sort of public goods, common infrastructure uh, and mechanisms to create access for folks, uh, digital access for folks. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you. I'm excited for this conversation. I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping we're gonna have a spirited conversation. I think I heard one little tidbit from yesterday, from one of yesterday's sessions, um, where I think the Hilton Foundation um, commissioned a study on partnerships, asking both public and private sides. And I think the average score that came back was a C. So as much as we sit here on panel and fora and panel after panel, and, and, and we do blog after blog, extolling the virtues of partnerships, I think, um, we have a long way to go in terms of what we're accomplishing with those partnerships. So I'm hoping really that during these next uh, 60 minutes that we have together, I would love to see sort of what can we do together to advance that dialogue and figure out, um, you know, how we start moving towards practical outcomes. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Tara. Perhaps uh, Gideon, I could ask you to come in. Sure. Um, so, uh, 
thanks, thanks so much. Wonderful to be here today. So, um, yeah, I mean, just to start with a word about uh, the 10 Partnership for Refugees, my organization, uh, we're a coalition of over 100 large multinational companies that are committed to supporting refugees. Um, and I'm very proud to count uh, Unilever and MasterCard uh, among our leading members. Uh, and I also note that Rebecca actually recently joined our advisory council. So I'll be, I'll be taking particularly careful note of what she uh, has to say today. Um, and we also work so closely with UNHCR um, and with Shireen and her colleagues. Shireen, who I might say, has comprehensively won the book at stakes today. Uh, our focus at TENT is really um, uh, where can businesses have the greatest impact um, uh, on the refugee crisis. Uh, and for us, we think that's um, in large part about helping refugees integrate into the economy. Um, uh, you know, we tend to think about refugees as being transient, but in fact, one and two are displaced for, for 20 plus years. So, so our focus um, as a coalition is really trying to work with companies uh, to help them integrate refugees into the economy, whether that's hiring refugees directly into their workforce, integrating refugees into the supply chain, supporting refugee entrepreneurs and small businesses or tailoring their commercial products to better meet refugee needs. Um, and throughout, as we, as we do this, our focus is obviously principally on helping refugees, but also trying to do that in a way that creates value for business so that businesses has an incentive to actually do more um, and scale up over time. So uh, looking forward uh, to, to the conversation today. Thanks. Thank you ever so much. And Sharon, um, if you'd like to come in as well, please. Thanks very much, and um, and just to echo my colleagues here, uh, thanks for organizing this discussion and uh, and for inviting me to speak. Um, it's great to be with familiar faces, and um, we all work very closely together, as you've just heard, with with Tara and Mastercard, with uh, Rebecca and Unilever, with Gideon and colleagues. So, um, so we're really pleased and very excited to to listen. You know. Uh, from the different perspectives on, on how we can work together on the SDGs. I mean, I think just to take, you know, uh, to take off, take on where Tara left off, where she said, you know, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and I think that's precisely, I think, you know, one of, one of the key words I saw in, uh, and attracted me to this panel was the challenges we face. Um, and I think it's, it's, while it's really important to celebrate the successes, uh, I think it's also really important to keep focused on what the challenge is. Um, and undoubtedly, the 2030 agenda presents the biggest challenge of, of our time in a way, well, COVID notwithstanding. Um, uh, and it's not just, you know, another UN idea or plan, but it's, it's an agenda that is obviously uh, concerned both business, civil society, NGOs, um, and the UN at large, uh, individuals uh, across the world. Um, and one of the core principles is is leaving no one behind, um, which which is exactly the, the you know the the value and the, the mantra behind UNHCR's mandate. Um, without you know making sure that refugees and displaced people are not left behind, uh, but unfortunately they're actually the furthest behind when it comes to the SDGs because they're not actually counted. I mean technically uh, within the host communities uh, in host countries in which they live. So actually, it's been a real challenge to look at the SDGs and refugees within the same scope. Um, and, you know, as you all know, I mean, the data is showing that, that you know, there's currently 79.5 million displaced um, as of the la end of the last year, um, which is basically 1% of, of humanity. I mean, one in every 97 uh, people. And so while, while there's many gains that's been realized, the internal displacement and, and the refugee situation uh, that, that are likely to continue um, will actually undermine the achievement of the S SDGs in many countries um, if we're not able to address the two things um, hand in hand. Um, and it's, it's fantastic to see the, the engagement of the private sector on this. Um, the, the private sector has taken this very seriously as we see from, from well, many of, of the colleagues around the call and, and beyond. Um, we have been increasingly engaged with them, both on the goals, but also um, with regard to the you know, global compact on refugees. We've seen the private sector bring their creativity, their resources, um, and their reach to drive change, both within their companies, but also around the world. Um, and, but we just need to do more. Um, last December, we had the Global Refugee Forum, um, and we had over 100 businesses present, um, including 
uh, the Tent Foundation or the Tent Partnership for Refugees representing a number of other of their partners. And it was just an indication of the of the shift in attitude um, that has really been increasing around the refugee topic uh, of the last um, five years. Um, and business engagement for us, you know, while it's been predominantly philanthropic in the past, it's really growing. Um, and we're seeing that, that the engagement of the private sector really goes beyond uh, the provision of much needed resources, but it also touches areas like innovation, technology, um, and expertise, which you know sit within business um, to help improve the living conditions of the most vulnerable, uh, including refugees um, and the force, forcibly displaced. So, you know, we need the private sector partnership um, now more than ever, I would say, um, not only for the resources, but also for the expertise, not only for those things, but also to help change the narrative um, and really to help the world realize that, uh, that refugees, you know, have a very important role to play um, and, and we all need to help them um, in achieving the SDGs. Thank you ever so much, Sharon. Um, so perhaps to, to kick off with uh, some of the questions, um, one, of the, one of the things that often comes up in discussions over public-private partnerships is how the private sector can play a role in uh, delivering on the SDGs. Um, but very often one of the first points that's often made is that businesses um, can take a starting point in their role by acting uh, responsibly. Um, what are some of the important ways that businesses can and need to act responsibly in the context of moving forward in, in terms of SDG fulfillment? Perhaps, um, uh, Rebecca, uh, as we have you from Unilever, it would be great to have your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, I, I mentioned really briefly at the beginning um, that for us, acting responsibly means really operating your business in, in a different way. So I, I alluded to one multi-stakeholder business model. So it's not about at Unilever short-term financial gain, but much more about long-term sustainable business growth, which I think actually underpins how business can and indeed does act responsibly. So for us, the multi-stakeholder business model means thinking about employees, it's about NGOs, it's about UN, it's about civil, civil society and prioritizing people and the planet. So I, I, I talked just a second ago about the, the size and scale of Unilever. So if we put a sustainability lens right the way across all of our operations, clearly that's a very different way for us to go about doing our business. So I, I normally like to split it into four different areas. So the first part is, is getting your own house in order. So making sure that our own business and our own operations are aligned to what we're talking about. Then right the way across our value chain. So from the farmers in the field, the manufacturing, the retailers. The third area is around our brands and the fourth is around wider society. So if I give you an example of, of how that will connect up to the SDGs, if you take, for example, wash, water, sanitation and hygiene, which is SDG six, we did a lot of combined work with others in the UN, others in the private sector, the NGOs, in the run up to the SDGs being launched to really try and lobby hard for an integrated goal on water, sanitation and hygiene because we all knew that if you try to actually bring together complementary areas, it's much more beneficial for the communities that we're trying to serve around the world. So if I take that full stage model I talked about, for us, that would mean in our own, getting our own house in order. So we signed up for things like the WBTSD, washing the workplace pledge, making sure that the farmers, the suppliers, everybody that we're dealing with is integrating wash into the way that they're approaching their own operations then we're thinking about how do we really use the power of those big consumer facing brands so that we put access to washing, access to clean drinking water, access to, to soap and hand washing, access to, to, to good sanitation and, and toilets. How do we put that front and center of our marketing strategies? So lots of big partnerships with brands like Domestos and Lifebuoy, really putting those messages front and center of the consumer work that we do. And then lastly, on the transformation in wider society, again, sticking with WASH as an example, we worked with Prime Minister Modi's government in India to really integrate the programs that we were doing on water and sanitation into the Indian government, into the Swatch Bharat campaign that he'd ambitiously set out for the country to improve WASH right the way across society. 
And then what we do at Unilever is then replicate that in many other areas of the SDGs. So we could be talking about number five on women, it could be on climate, it could be on inclusive society. And I think the second key area is really making sure that actually that focus on the SDGs and that focus on sustainability is built into the governments and decision-making criteria right the way across the business. So for example, at Unilever, we have one of our board subcommittees that actually looks at and deals with sustainability. And it's tied into uh, the way that uh, senior management at Unilever, uh, their compensation packages are structured. So really achieving those sustainability goals. So I think, you know, lastly, I think the real focus for us as well is making sure that we, we take this three-stage approach around the SDGs. So advocate on the areas that are crucially important to Unilever's business, working on what it is that we want to achieve in the external environment. So for example, working with governments on, on, on policy, it might be working um, to implement uh, programs in schools. The second area is around building the right partnerships. So really making sure that we work with the right kind of retail partners, NGO, government partners, academic partners, to bring and activate these programs, to bring them to life. And then thirdly, through scaling. So thinking about how do we reach through mobile, through digital, through innovative and blended financing, how do we reach millions of people? And collectively, when I think you put all of that together, it's a, it's a small snapshot for me of how when business puts sustainability front and center and you orient yourself towards contributing to and achieving the SDGs, you can actually have a pretty sustained um, and long-term impact. And ultimately, you're helping governments and, and countries and citizens around the world to achieve and progress through the SDGs and at the same time, grounding it front and center in core business operations. Thank you very much for that, Rebecca. I wonder um, if others would be interested to come on, uh, come in on this. Uh, Gideon, maybe Tara would be interested. Sharon, uh, also. Sure, I can come in if, <clears throat> if it's helpful. I would want to build maybe on some of the things that Rebecca mentioned. Actually, um, I loved Rebecca your mention of long-term thinking. To me, acting uh, responsibly in a business context is. Uh, <clears throat> I sort of jotted down four notes. I think as as Rebecca was chatting, one was long-term thinking. Uh, so what does long-term thinking means? It means sort of, it doesn't mean uh, abandoning what is business's ultimate profitability goals. Business ha has to be profitable to, be, to exist, but it's how do we think about uh, sustainability for a business and profitability in the longest, with the longest term lens that we potentially can. Uh, you know, at MasterCard, we uh, had a vice, we have a vice chairman who used to always say that, you know, business can't succeed in a failing world. So ultimately, for business to succeed, we have to ensure that the environments and the markets and the countries and the people who we seek to serve are successful and prosperous. So if you take that as the longest term lens, which is not always commercially practical, um, obviously our engagement in uh, bettering the world and in, and in encouraging thriving and flourishing societies is critical. Um, I would say, secondly, it's embedding, acting responsibly is embedding this notion into all aspects of business, but approaching it as a business. I think all too often, I sort of touched on this perhaps in my opening remarks, all too often we have uh, business, some businesses, uh, you know, Unilever is a, is a shining example of not doing this, uh, of doing it the right way, I'd say. Uh, we hope that MasterCard, uh, you know, is, is also a good example, you know, of, of similar good behavior of embedding um, social thinking in, as Rebecca mentioned, in every aspect of our business. When we think about the SDGs, when we think about gender issues, when we think about um, the Black Lives Matter issues that have extended, that have uh, come up in, in, the, in the American context, we always approach it from the perspective of, people. First, what are we doing inside our own house? How do we instill decency as a quotient within the, uh, within the core of how we interact within our own people? Then we talk about uh, products. So how do we ensure that whether it's a gender lens or an inclusive lens or whether it's a marginalized lens that we, that we uh, imbue that or that we inculcate that into the products and the business and the solutions that we bring to market. And then the third pillar is society. So I think embedding it into all aspects of business is what is um, this key to uh, acting, you know, responsibly. I think thirdly, it's, I'm going to bring up the point I made again, which is 
operating with your core competencies. We've got to stop, I think, leaning on business for philanthropy. I think businesses are not philanthropic organizations. The more we do that, the more we're acting, we're asking uh, people to do unnatural acts. Our C my CEO always says, he has a funny quote, he talks about, you can't ask people to do unnatural acts. Actually, I'll quote my elder brother. My elder brother used to say all the time when I was growing up, never teach a pig to sing. It, it frustrates you and it, annoy, it annoys you, it annoy, frustrates you and annoys the pig, right? And that's how I feel it is when you're trying to get businesses to go out there and just act in purely philanthropic manners. Um, it's not natural. A, B, we should be doing things that are most adjacent to what we do naturally because that's how we're going to have the maximum impact. So I would say that point. And um, so to keep in mind commercial sustainability, core competency, take a long-term view. Thank you very much. Uh, would anybody else like to come in on, on that question? Maybe I'll just jump in and say, what, what makes me really happy to hear in this panel and how you're talking about the goals is that we've gone away from this sort of tunnel vision that I'm gonna focus on goal five and that's, that's it. I think if anything, this health, humanitarian and now development crisis that we're in has shown us just how much intersectionality there is and how much we really need them as a cohesive, as you say, throughout the business and, now, and throughout, frankly, consumers' lives. They, they're almost a seamless mix of um, all the priorities that we need in order to succeed and then to be able to build on that. So that makes me really happy to hear. And I would love to hear a little bit more too about how you think scale up is going to be happening now, given everything we're going through um, in these like a triple threat crisis. Um, and just to hear a little bit more where you're headed on that, that would be very interesting for myself. Thanks. Hi, thanks very much, Anne-Marie. Um, perhaps in the interest of sort of moving on with, with some of the other questions, um, I can follow on from your point there and, and talk a little bit about uh, the, 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 the triple threat crisis, um, as you uh, eloquently put it, that we are, are now facing. Um, and ask <clears throat> the pandemic, uh, uh, the various lockdowns that have been enforced around the world, changed the ways in which business has been conducted, uh, making companies think, uh, of new ways and, and innovative ways to carry on working um, with virtual platforms that obviously caused a, a lot of challenges across the board for many of the different stakeholders involved in trying to, to respond to some of the challenges that have arisen. I, I wonder what, what kind of innovations or, or different operating approaches um, have you looked at or seen to be effective in terms of partnerships um, that will help in establishing uh, new public-private sector relations uh, for companies at a time uh, when things have been uh, so so complicated. Um, perhaps Gideon, I can I'll ask you to come in on that. Sure, so I mean one, one aspect that we've been thinking a lot about um, is one of the sort of fundamental challenges in the refugee crisis is that you know, more than 80% of refugees live in middle and low income countries. Many of those countries uh, uh, have their own economic challenges, many of them don't allow refugees to work. Um, and if there's one silver lining of the COVID crisis, it's the fact that companies have made significant advances in thinking about remote work. Uh, and uh, actually several of them we've been speaking to are even sort of seeing cost savings um, associated with you know, call centers where people don't have to come to a physical place um, and can uh, participate in call centers remotely. Um, and so we're really just um, at, at the very beginning of this, but trying to sort of grapple with and think about, is there a way to use uh, multinational companies, um, technological advancements, sort of cultural uh, uh, um, sort of receptivity to remote work, uh, at the same time that these multinational companies, especially in the tech sector, um, uh, face so many sort of diversity challenges themselves, is there a way to connect them to you know, qualified refugees um, that you know, are sitting in Turkey or sitting in Kenya uh, without access to the local labor market. So I think, I think that's an example of something that we think is, is quite exciting. If, if, if there's one good thing that comes out of this crisis. Sharon, I can see you smiling there. Perhaps you're interested to come in further. 
Well, I'm glad that Gideon's, Gideon's bringing in the optimistic angle because I think, you know, one of the things that, that has been so challenging for us um, is that, I mean, I think in a way with the refugee situation, I mean, as Gideon said, you know, 80% of refugees are living in low-income countries and they're also living in the most far-flung locations in the world. Um, and we're talking, you know, in border, mostly close to borders. Um, that has almost been their saving grace, I think, for, for actually, because, you know, they've actually been so far removed um, that we haven't seen any major outbreaks um, of the pandemic in refugee hosting areas. And we're really relieved by that. And we're absolutely prepared. I mean, we're, we're constantly preparing in case that were to, in case there would be an outbreak. But I think what the pandemic has shown is how cut off these communities are. Um, it is, it has, we have, because we travel to the camps so often, because our staff are so closely involved with the refugees and the communities, because we have brought so many new innovations, but they are dependent on being in a physical location. So we have instant network schools, which require, but they require students to be in the classroom, but then we have this great technology that comes with it. But all of a sudden with the pandemic, we haven't been able to move forward with any of these innovations. And uh, we haven't been able to allow the refugees to take advantage of, of some of the great um, things the private sector has actually helped us uh, develop. So, you know, it's been a real, um, I would say awakening um, that while we've known that there needs to be a digital revolution and a massive innovation in the way we work, um, and we've tried, I mean, uh, and we are working towards that, um, it can't come fast enough because uh, we are we aren't have not been able to to really um, sufficiently access the population that we serve um, in a way that's effective. So, um, I think hopefully when this is when this when we move forward from the pandemic, I think we can really look towards um, across the SDGs and say, okay, what is um, how can we uh, work on on innovations and digital technology that can allow us to serve the refugees while Gideon works on having them, uh, you know, using it to their advantage for, for employment. Thank you ever so much, uh, Tara. I, Rebecca, I know, I know that Unilever has been very much um, sort of front and center uh, with, with a lot of COVID response support, um, obviously a significant partnership with DFID. Uh, to really make sure that um, uh, a lot of resources uh, and expertise gets uh, pushed forward to, to help the response. Um, I wonder, would you like to come in and, and explain a little bit about some of the new ways and innovations of uh, carrying on working that Unilever has looked at? I'd love to, thank you. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right. We, you know, we have had to do business in a very different way during, during the lockdown and, and trying to, to deal at a practical level uh, with the challenges that, that COVID-19 has brought up. It, I have to say, when I think about some of our own work on our own operations, you know, when I look at the supply chain uh, of Unilever and I look at our own manufacturing teams who have been in factories every single day producing essential items like soaps, like sanitizers, you, know, you really realize actually where the true value, and, the, and this is not just in, in, in Unilever, but right the way across the board, you know, the true value of all those jobs that perhaps weren't necessarily front and center historically. Um, so certainly for us, it's really pushed us into thinking about how, how do we work in a different way? How do we take that multi-stakeholder model that I talked about in the last question and make sure that in our response to COVID, we are trying to do the best that we can to make a positive contribution. So we did do some big product donations that you, you talked about earlier with partners like UNHCR, with Shirin on the, on the call here, and UNICEF, we contributed 100 million in product through donations of soaps and sanitizers, bleach, food, essential items that we know are absolutely critical in helping communities through the crisis. We extended 500 million of cash flow relief across our extended value chain. So things like early payment for small SME suppliers, we extended credit to small scale retail customers, whether whose business really, really relies on Unilever. And when you think about new models, you mentioned that the, the Hygiene and Behaviour Change Coalition that we've developed in partnership with, with the UK government. What we've essentially tried to do there is to put together Unilever's expertise in behaviour change in getting people to wash their hands critically with soap at those crucial points through the day, but also adding in wider public health messaging around things like wearing a mask and social distancing, 
working with the UK government and 30 different NGOs to disseminate those programs on the ground. We've looked at how we can leverage our research and development expertise with things like UK Ventilator Challenge. We've swapped over a lot of supply chains around the world to be able to really respond very locally to acute demands for things like sanitizer. And I would say as well, you know, digital, digital, digital everywhere, right the way across all of our business models from e-commerce to utilizing tech to prevent things like deforestation in our supply chain to rolling up behavior change programs through digital. And I guess at you know, a, a, a sort of wider, more macro level, all of us and you know, all of these conversations, I think make us realize that in 2020 was, was set out for this great exciting year on progressing the SDGs and the COP and Biodiversity Summit, Food Systems Summit, etc. And then of course, so much has been stopped in its tracks, like Sharon was saying, because of the practicalities um, of COVID and, and, and not being able to travel. So I think for you know, big multinational business like ours and, and, and Tara MasterCard, who we do a lot of work with on, on financial inclusion, it's really sort of a fundamental shift point around you know, how do we actually do business? And we've seen that climate change and social inequity are you know, really the, you know, underpinning massive issues that we just have to now tackle. And if we are going to build back better after COVID and after the challenges um, that it's thrown up, you know, I'm heartened, I guess, by things like the, the EU green recovery deals and stimulus packages, you know, that are putting livelihood and job creation front and center. Because we're listening to, to Gideon and Shirin talking about the pressures and the challenges on refugees. It, it just reinforces that we do need to build back in, in, in a different way. And I think, you know, it isn't just us talking um, in, in these kind of forums, it's actually widespread across the world that I think communities are really starting to, to think about and to want to associate or not associate with organizations and with companies that haven't responded in a way that they feel is appropriate and, and just during the, the, the corona pandemic. You know, Edelman did some research recently that said a third of people Said that they don't want to associate anymore with brands that haven't responded in the right way. You know, I think nearly three quarters of people that they interviewed have said that companies that just purely put profits before thinking about people and thinking about the planet will now lose their trust forever. So I think there is now this really big opportunity to achieve the SDGs and, and you know, the job creation and the economic and, and, and positive environmental impact that they can if companies really grasp that opportunity to build back in a way that is more equitable you know, right the way across the value chain really helps so many of those marginalized communities that have once again you know, suffered disproportionately um, with the COVID pandemic. So you know, for me, I guess the, the, the big lesson from all of this is get businesses on board, engage in this multi-stakeholder model, engage for the long term, think about the partners that you can and should be working with that complement what you can bring to the table. Um, you know, and if something more positive could come out of, you know, what has been a, a devastating year for so many people around the world, um, I hope is this move to this wider model. And, and I'm really thinking about putting ESG right at the heart of, of, of our operations. Thank you ever so much for that, Rebecca. And, and uh, really appreciated that you've, uh, raising the points about complementarity there and, and organizations really thinking about how they fit uh, together with sort of proper synergies uh, rather than trying to force things through a little bit. It was mentioned a few times in the opening statements that um, absolutely we should be um, celebrating the successes uh, of positive partnerships, but we also have to acknowledge some of the significant challenges uh, that we face. Um, I wonder, uh, Anne-Marie, could you share some of your insights or experiences when, when we've been looking at some of the challenges to create successful collaborations between public and private organizations uh, from your perspective? You know, we've been talking with um, economists from around the world and, and private sector partners and bringing together these ideas around where, where do we need to put some of the focus that isn't always where the focus is. And one of the areas is on SME, small and medium-sized enterprises. These are the smaller ones who were maybe need that extra support and what is that going to look like? And so using that as a lens, one of the lenses, we're looking at what are some of the 
safety nets that need to be in place moving forward as we recover better together um, that haven't been in the place and that can actually keep these smaller businesses afloat. Um, what will it take? How can they connect with bigger businesses? How can they connect with their communities? A lot of the times we're hearing from community members and that they trust the community because that's where the food is coming from. That's who they see from the day to day. So what happens now when these markets, when you can't go into the market, when you can't be together again? So I've been really excited to hear about some of these partnerships that are trying to bring the informal sector um, onto an online digital world. And, and it's great. And they're connecting in like in Ecuador, in like 100,000. That's what they're aiming for, 100,000 informal to start with. And I'd love to see where we are six months from now. How are they able to continue to help them once they're online? Are they able to survive? How are they able to connect with each other and help each other continue in a completely new different kinds of ways of doing business um, that are still gonna be sustainable, that are still gonna reach communities, that are still gonna give people access. Um, these are the kinds of things that we've been hearing about and I'd be really curious to hear too more when, how, how do you connect, as we were just saying, consumers are going to want to be able to trust the brands that have really thought about people and the planet. Um, and how can we get this, that accountability and transparency message to more, um, to show that it is good business, that it's really, really good business to do, and it's good for people and it's good for the planet. Thanks. Thank you very much. Tara, you, you mentioned in your opening statement around, around this topic as well about um, seeing the business as a, a social impact business that you're um, working on. And um, also we're trying to think about uh, trust and um, inclusivity, shared values in partnerships so they can be built on a foundation that's got the potential not only to be stable but to grow. Um, I wonder, uh, what are some of the challenges that you've, uh, you've seen in, in collaborations of public-private partnerships? <coughs> So I think um, it's interesting. Maybe I'll introduce sort of some of the challenges and then maybe one of the mechanisms that we've also founded, I think, to start to resolve some of these challenges, right? So I think as we start to bring together two uh, multiple, let's go back, let me take a step back here. I think for any intervention, right, I, I referenced this term ecosystem or taking an ecosystem-based approach. I think one of the things that we've realized is that it is critical to take what we call partnership and operationalize it. All too often, uh, we uh, have, we, the broader set of organizations, I think have a tendency to um, take partnership as an end in itself, signing an MOU, making a declaration, making an objective, a claim, we're going to serve a billion people, a hundred million people. It always involves millions and billions and trillions of, of numbers. I think one of the challenges I've seen at the macro level is how do you then operationalize that? Because partnership cannot be an end in itself. We need to figure out, get really tactical about what are we, whether it's private and private or private and public, what are we actually trying to do together? We, all, we have a tendency to think that innovation is an end in itself. So we hold grand challenges and we have, you know, we, we, we own competitions. And I would argue that in order to accomplish the critical goals that we have today of giving food, water, clothing, shelter, power to the critically marginalized, there's not a whole lot of innovation that's required. There's no more partnerships that are required. What is required is a very tactical, methodical, operational way of going to market together. How do you bring these actors together to execute together? What is our not partnership plan, not as our, what's not our strategy, but what is our practical execution plan? I think that's what we need to be focused on. We founded about three, um, three, four years ago, I forget these things. I made the announcement a long time ago is all I know. Something called the Smart Communities Coalition. Um, Smart Communities Coalition, UNHCR is a member. We've got about 35 different organizations. Uh, Tent actually was one of our original hosts, uh, you know, for Smart Communities Coalition. MasterCard uh, co-chairs it with um, Power Africa uh, out of uh, USAID. But what Smart Communities Coalition was meant to be was exactly that. Not a coalition or a partnership for the sake of partnership, but a tactical execution mechanism 
that de-risked private sector and public sector, coming, private sector, NGO, civil society, coming together for joint execution. You asked me what some of the barriers are. Jonathan, you know them as well as I do. They range everything from what is the commercial framework? What, is the, what are the rules and regulations around how we RFP for something or how we procure from the private sector? When can, we, when can something be blended together? What are the, how do you de-risk public sector from engaging with the private sector and not getting backlash? We've seen that a lot. We've had a lot of partners come to us and say, we want what you've got, we need your help. But basically, unless we're able to give it philanthropically or free, they don't know how to take it from us. That's a big challenge. Um, and I always say, I'm, I'm able to, yeah, sure, I can give something away for free. How much, though? If you want to address billions of people and trillions of dollars, it can't be free. So Smart Communities Coalition, what is it trying to do? It's trying to identify what are those, that common infrastructure that everyone requires, power, digital tools, connectivity, and then identify how we can crowd in actors around a tactical plan to execute upon that in a given market. It's not saying a goal of ending hunger. It's really saying, how do we instill or how do we implement digital infrastructure, connectivity, and power in the markets of Uganda and Kenya? Who's with us? What, is the, what are the legal constructs that are required? What are the commercial constructs that are required? What are the operational last mile entities that are required? So um, that's what I'd say is sort of both been a challenge and then a potential solution. Thank you very much, Tara. And, and whilst you were speaking there, I saw both Gideon and uh, Sharon smiling. So I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really a, a great uh, conversation uh, for, for both of you to come in. And perhaps, uh, Sharon, you'd like to, you'd like to start off and then follow by Gideon. Well, thanks a lot, Jonathan. We've had this conversation quite a few times. That's why I was smiling, because I think um, one of the first conversations I had with Tara was exactly about this. And I think one of the challenges that we've faced, um, and to be honest, I mean, I think, you know, it's important to be really honest about these things is there is still a great skepticism, not at UNHCR, but in the broader humanitarian community about the role of the private sector. And it goes back to the original question about um, the intentions at doing business responsibly um, and ensuring that the, the businesses that are getting engaged in the humanitarian world and on the SDGs are um, doing so in accordance with UN values, of do no harm principles, et cetera. Um, and I think that's the very starting point. And we're still not um, at a place where I think you know, you have that widespread trust still um, among the humanitarian community at large vis-a-vis um, -vis the private sector. And then I think what Tara said was absolutely right. And then what's the operating model? Okay, let's say we have the trust. We know what some of the problems are. We know what the problems we want to solve are. We know, you know, who has the solutions for, to address those problems. What's the operating model beyond the philanthropic model? We know the philanthropic model inside and out. It's working. And I would say I'm always an advocate that there is still a role for business to play in philanthropy, um, but there's also a much bigger role for business to play more broadly. And I think really to build that trust beyond the operating, you know, and coming, you know, that's the UN rules and regulations, whether that's with the UN or not. Um, and what is the procurement? What is, what is a social enterprise? What's a business? What's an NGO? And, and having a whole shift in mindset. And I think the other way to build trust as well is that in parallel to putting it together, those operating models is really looking at how business can engage um, and, and demonstrate its um, authenticity on these topics through really being, you know, demonstrating through its leadership, through engaging its consumers, through engaging its employees, you know, advocating, um, being an advocate, helping change the narrative. I think there's a lot of, you know, I think we sometimes zoom in, I mean, either on the philanthropic or on the kind of expertise and core business aspects. Um, and I think one of the ways, and I think this is what, you know, Gideon and, and colleagues are doing a lot about, of is 
okay, how do we use business for actually changing the situation on the ground more um, creatively? Uh, and that's really through advocacy and work done um, through customers and through leadership um, and through employees um, and really taking a stand on issues. And I think that builds an authenticity. Um, and then you see that with, with both MasterCard and, and Unilever and the work they've been doing, but it's not yet widespread across the business community. And I think if we want to build that trust between the humanitarian community and the private sector, um, we need, a lot more of that would go a long way. Thank you very much. And, and Gideon, just, uh, just to add, uh, with some of the challenges, a, a very dear colleague um, from the private sector once said to me, you know one private sector partner, you know one private sector partner. And I think that often raises uh, multiple challenges for organizations because um, it is so difficult to have the resources to understand the different dynamics and priorities and ways of operating, working and approaches that different private partners are often looking for. I wonder, um, particularly uh, coming from where you're coming from, whether that's also something that you can speak to. So if you'll forgive me, I was actually really hoping to pick up on something that both Tara and Shirin said, which I think is just so important, um, which is around the sort of, you know, the, the idea that sort of businesses uh, can't do this for free and the idea that businesses need to benefit. And I, I think, I think, it's probably a problem generally in the nonprofit sector, but I think it's especially acute with refugee populations because there's a sense that, you know, they're vulnerable, that therefore businesses can't, can't seem to benefit. And, and, and I do think it is, it is such a constraint on, on business action. And it's just, it's so important that we, that we overcome that. I mean, for, from, from our perspective, if, if a company is just doing it for free, it's going to be temporary. It's going to be, um, it's going to be pretty minimal. It's not going to be scaled up. And we think refugees, and we think about refugees in the labor force, we think they actually present a really compelling business proposition. We, we, we have data that they stay longer on the job. We have data that they're more willing to relocate for a job. Both of those things are valuable. And so if, if we're just focusing on, you know, businesses doing it um, uh, just, just, just to be sort of decent, there's a few companies that will do that temporarily, but the way we really reach lots of businesses, the median business, the ones that aren't, um, aren't, aren't, aren't the ones on the screen that are you know, leaders on this is, is, is by really making that business case and making the case that businesses will actually benefit by, by getting involved. And I think that, that is a hurdle that's just so critical for us to, for us to overcome. Uh, thank you ever so much, Gideon. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, on that, just uh, just noticing um, how we are on time, I want to be able to give everybody the opportunity to perhaps um, have some closing statements and just ask each of you the question, if there's one major takeaway, really, that you would like um, colleagues, uh, people working in other organizations that potentially uh, could be partners or are current partners and you're looking to give them good pieces of advice moving forward and developing strong partnerships, um, what would that piece uh, of advice be? Um, perhaps Gideon, you could uh, yeah, carry on. Thank you. Sure. I mean, happy to happy just to repackage my previous point just to close, which is sort of I think successful private sector, private public partnerships need to be designed in a way that not only benefit um, uh, the vulnerable, but also in some way build in some sort of um, benefit for the business. Understanding that it's it's a, maybe a long term benefit. It's it's you know be benefit sort of. Um, uh, uh, understood in a sophisticated way, but it has to be designed in a way that the, the business is going to see long-term benefits by being involved in that. And that's, that's, that's uh, I think, a key ingredient for doing this in a way that, that companies then have an incentive to actually do more of it at greater scale than more places. Thank you. Um, Anne-Marie? I really like this idea that these sustainable solutions need sustainable partnerships, that they can't be these always these quick fixes and expect these longer term gains and values. And so I'd love to see how we could, as the Office for Partnerships, help make that connection and figure out ways of making it easier for people to connect and understand um, for the longer term solutions that we're looking for right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sharon. Perhaps, uh, perhaps some final thoughts from your side. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, you know, also sort of repeat something uh, I said earlier, which is, you know, be authentic uh, and genuine. And that's something that Gideon and I have discussed a lot. I mean, make, and, and something Tara mentioned, 
make it linked to, to, to your core business and make it really um, have buy-in from your leadership down. Without the leadership of the CEO, it, it's not going to, to be long-term. It's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to be scalable. So make sure you have that before you embark uh, on, on whatever topic you choose. Thank you ever so much. And Rebecca? So, so all, the, all the good points uh, have been said, but you know, but I think on, you know, on a serious note, actually, you know, I agree with all those things that, you know, these, these partnerships are a relationship. So you, you get out what you put in like you do in any relationship. And I think, you know, we, lots and lots of organizations, you know, have moved so far from, you know, the skepticism and the cynicism that, that, that Sharon was talking about. Um, and I would like to think that, you know, approaching in a, in a much more open way, um, being really honest about what it is that you're bringing to, to, to this relationship, you know, and crucially what you're expecting to get out of it and treating it with the same professionalism and the same structure and rigor that you would do when you were dealing with the stakeholders that perhaps you're more comfortable at, at dealing with. And I think that sort of old fashioned kind of viewing the private sector as, you know, as, as, as basically a, a donor to just give some cash. You know, I believe that is really outdated now. There's a much greater recognition of we have certain skills and, and expertise, but we, we really don't know how to do lots of things either. So actually for us, choosing complementary partners who work in a different way, whether it's private sector, we do a lot of work with MasterCard because MasterCard bring a whole set of expertise that we didn't have as Unilever. And the same with, 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 with the other organizations on the phone. So I think being open and honest, being really clear on what you're putting in and being really clear on what you want to get out of it, you know, and, and putting some work into it. Thank you very much, Rebecca and Tara. Um, I guess I'd say maybe three closing points. One would be, let's move from partnerships to tactical operational execution. Um, one that uh, envisages or that plans for the long term, the long term that in that entails or that includes the sustainable commercial funding execution legal model that's going to sustain that end objective. Uh, second would be the same points, just picking on what Sharon and others have said, but do what you do best. If we all bring to the table uh, what we do best, there's nothing that can stop us. And I'd say lastly, it is to acknowledge that doing this and being bold, if we, are bold, do what we do best, do it well together, we can solve these challenges. But each side needs to absorb a little risk. It's not gonna be without risk. And that is on the private sector side, right? Having to potentially look at profit and look at, sustain, look at commercial sustainability in a longer term lens, with a different lens, with, uh, with, a, with a broader view of objectives. And on the public sector side and the civil society side, perhaps having to engage with private sector in ways that weren't previously comfortable. So I think we need to get comfortable with a little bit more risk and overcome our, our um, uh, we can overcome these challenges. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Tara. Um, and to everybody, uh, enormously appreciated um, for your uh, uh, time and investment today in the discussion. I think there were some incredible points that have come out. For me, personally, I have to say many, many uh, really interesting learning points. So uh, very, very much appreciated from that side. Some, some big, uh, big key, key notes really to come out. This um, sort of building narrative, which certainly I've heard now uh, for the last years, but I, I think now we have to really look at it and take it as a, as a given that really public-private partnerships and, and the idea of it being about, um, or them being about philanthropy or grants is just simply outdated. Um, and organizations have to be um, much more aware of the functionality and purpose of business. Um, conversations about you know, acting naturally and, and not asking businesses to do things that are unnatural to them. It's, it's not going to be an effective way of, of operating. We spoke about authenticity, added value, uh, being genuine, making sure that leadership uh, has buy-in when you're looking at building these partnerships. So you have a, a strong foundation upon which you can build something that's sustainable, um, complementarity, and thinking about the different core business aspects of the different partners that you're looking to link up with and, and what it is that you do as well. And of course, scalability. 
Um, businesses, very often I find when I'm uh, talking to businesses, think big, uh, they're very ambitious and have uh, the ability to do things that are very often beyond um, even, even the initial thoughts of a lot of humanitarian partners that, that do multiple projects, but, but sometimes nothing like uh, to the scale that businesses um, uh, can operate. Um, and I think a, a very good point as well made by uh, Rebecca towards the end um, there, which is that they're relationships. Um, and it's so easy to forget um, that actually what we're building uh, very often is relationships. And that requires investment and time. And it requires us to be transparent um, and direct and bold uh, in, in what we're trying to achieve. Um, so thank you, everybody, ever so much uh, for your inputs. Um, I hope that people listening uh, have enjoyed the, the discussion as much as I have. And I very much hope to remain in contact with all of you moving forward. Thank you.